Hi, Dr. David. Hello, Tammy. So nice to be here. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself and share your book, and then we'll get started answering questions. Okay. Hi, everybody. I am subbing for Dr. Rob tonight. My name is David Fawcett, and I'm a sex therapist and therapist uh, based out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. But I'm collaborating with, with uh, Dr. Rob on uh, some of the programs we're doing at, at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles and hopefully elsewhere. Um, we, my specialty basically is the fused uh, addiction of chemical substances and drugs, such as um, methamphetamine and sex, cocaine and sex, uh, or using alcohol to disinhibit sex. So anytime those two things get connected, uh, I do work with that. My, my book on the subject is called Less Men and Meth. This one particularly deals with gay men and methamphetamine and sex. Um, and we do, we do receive a lot of amphetamine users. And I also wanted to, Tammy had mentioned, I did a, I co-produced a documentary called Crystal City, um, which follows about eight or 10 guys, uh, gay men in New York City in recovery from methamphetamine. And that's won all kinds of awards this year at film festivals and it'll be out on, for distribution, I can't say which, uh, this week. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so until it's out, uh, it'll be on one of the big streaming uh, venues. So I'm well, really- great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I, I have watched the um, documentary, and it's tough to because they're in recovery, and then they're not. You know, there it is. It isn't a hundred percent. And there, there was one person in particular that was. It was tough. So, but it's a really good um, view of things. So I would very much encourage you to to watch. I had the privilege of watching it. Um, uh, with David, so he could even answer questions for me live. It was helpful. So, so speaking of answering questions live, we've got some questions. So if you are joining us, we invite you. You can ask questions even anonymously. So feel free to ask questions, whatever you know, is on your mind uh, regarding uh, sex addiction or the co-occurring. You know, you've got an expert in co-occurring sex addiction and chemical dependency. Um, but you know, any topic around uh, this area. It's sex, love, and addiction. So we're here to, to help. And you can, like I said, ask them anonymously. So the first question is, are you able to recommend an alternative program for an addict's recovery other than 12-step program? Well, thanks. And that's a good question. A lot of this comes up a lot. Uh, people have different objections sometimes or difficulties with the 12-step program. I always, my own clients, I kind of encourage to keep trying a little bit to maybe get comfortable and break through some of the resistance, but there are programs out there as an alternative and even as a, um, a collateral kind of program. The one that most often I think that's best run is something called Smart Recovery, um, and that you can see at smartrecovery.org. Uh, they are a little different than the 12-step programs in that they are facilitated, meaning that people um, have to go through a certification course to run the groups. And so you don't come in, it's not self-run, it's, it's uh, facilitated, they follow a workbook. It's very kind of um, psychological and cognitive behavioral in terms of making decision lists and l looking at thoughts and interrupting behaviors through uh, analyzing thoughts and that kind of thing. It can be very valuable. They, they don't have a spiritual component. And so I, I often send clients who are really struggling with that piece to Smart Recovery. And very often they find that kind of breaks the ice and they the two programs can actually go quite well together as well. But I think Smart Recovery is the biggest. Uh, refuge Recovery is out there, more of a Buddhist-oriented um, recovery system. Uh, and there are some others, but those I think, uh, I think Smart Recovery and the 12-step fellowships is by far the biggest. And of course, 12-step has by far the longest track record. Um, and I think, at least, I think if you're in an urban area, there are so many kind of variations of 12-step meetings that, um, that are true to the foundational elements and traditions of the 12-step meeting, but they, they tailor it. Um, so, uh, for example, we have um, a meeting where I live that for a 12-step meeting, but it's for people who are uh, abstaining from God, <laughs> in a way. They, you know, they, don't have a, they don't have a higher power, but they have, they, uh, have other things. So, so it's a kind of a weird twist on fellowships, but, but I think you can find something maybe to be comfortable. Uh, with with yourself in those meetings. So I'd encourage you to stick with the 12 step, but smart recovery, I think what I, I would say is the best alternative. So here's an interesting question. It isn't in there. Well, it's an interesting question to me. We'll see. Um, so when somebody has co-occurring addiction, you know, so say they're using meth and they're also a sex addict, you know, if you go to an S meeting, you're not going to talk about the meth. If you go to the meth, 
you know, you're not going to really talk about the sex. So, so like smart recovery, one of the things I think I know about that is you, it's more generic. Is that accurate? So you could talk about both? Yes. I mean, I think, I think traditionally have been more welcoming to what we would call behavioral or process addictions than I think the 12-step fellowships, which tend to focus on whatever their defining characteristic is, alcohol, narcotics, sex, gambling, and so on. So yes, yeah, smart recovery is kind of more universal, but I think absolutely those people you described, the people that are, have co-occurring, um, can absolutely find a really comfortable home and support system in the 12-step fellowships as well. And I, for example, the case you mentioned, the chemsex clients who might be using uh, a guy who might be using cocaine and, and going with escorts or prostitutes or using it with sex in general um, might find uh, support in NA, Narcotics Anonymous, as well as one of the S meetings. And I think that's almost really important to have kind of a, a constellation of fellowships that, that meet the right case because very often um, the tools that we have in, in S meeting recovery with the boundary plans uh, are non-existent in the 12-step meetings of that cover just substances. And the expectation of any kind of behavioral change in the substance-oriented 12-step programs is abstinence. And of course, uh, we don't want abstinence from sex. We want healthy sexuality and intimacy. So, so the S programs really do that well. So I think it's a matter of combining them sometimes. The one thing I will say, if people are interested in methamphetamine or have been no, that came out wrong. If yeah. people have trouble with, <laughs> with methamphetamine, um, Crystal Meth Anonymous uh, was actually founded because it, it provided a safe place where people could talk about that connection between the drug and the sex. And they, and they obviously don't do graphic sexual language or they don't trigger people. They should be very carefully run. But it is an opportunity to talk about some of those sexual triggers that go with the drug connection. And oftentimes, if you do that in a traditional AA or NA meeting, they're gonna say, you know, we don't talk about sex here, just stick to your alcohol, stick to your narcotics or whatever. And they, so it, CMA gives you an opportunity to do all that in one place. And I'm not familiar, isn't it? But am I, because I never did cocaine somehow amazingly enough, but um, Cocaine Anonymous, there's a separate one for Cocaine Anonymous too. So I wonder if they would be a little, because they're again, more apt to um, have the co-occurring struggles. Right, and I have not been to a cocaine anonymous meeting myself, but I've heard that uh, they are uh, more open. And they really came out of that same need because of people recognized that dual addiction in themselves and really needed a place to talk about that. And uh, cocaine anonymous provided that. It's harder to find these days. Even in, I live near Miami, which is like cocaine capital. And even here where it's hard to find uh, compared to CMA meetings, crystal meth meetings. Well, and, yeah, and probably because things have shifted a little bit. So, um, but in the rooms, you know, Dr. Rob does a meeting on uh, Friday nights for sex addiction, but in the rooms has a number of online meetings. And I would hope that there would be some online meetings, you know, if there isn't something locally, you know, for you there as well. One of the things I wanted to say about a 12 step meeting, because I've been to a bunch of those, and just some of them are better than others and some that I go, yeah, I'm fine. I'm glad I'm at a meeting, you know, good and all that kind of stuff, but this could never be my home group. And, you know, it, it, so, so even if you go, well, I've been to a couple of, you know, uh, of S meetings, you know, and, or I've been to this meeting a couple of times, check other ones because they all kind of have their own little personality and what people, um, you know, what people it's, it's, or do you, some of them get gurus. Those are the ones to avoid. If, if there's a guru that has kind of taken over the meeting, that's, you know, in my opinion, just my opinion, that's a terrible meeting, you know? Um, um, you know, that's one I don't want to go to. I, I want it to be the group and, you know, it needs to be all of us and not one person lecturing. Smart rec here, there's the trained person, all good. And I've heard a lot of good things about smart recovery as well. So, you know, but from, um, you know, from that standpoint, there are more, keep looking, and, uh, you know, and perspectives change too. Okay, next question. I go, I quit pornography and masturbation after decades long habit includes disclosure to my wife of 30 years. I'm still having trouble trying to stop compulsively, I'm sorry, trying to stop compulsively objectifying women. This action understandably devastates my already traumatized wife when I do it in her presence. Immediately afterwards, I deny it, something she just saw with her own eyes. I profess to my wife, I can't stop. Do you have any advice to help? 
Yeah, thank you for that question. That's um, something that's not unusual, actually. Um, I think the key to that, uh, to making progress in that area, is, is really becoming aware. And I really recommend using mindfulness for that. And by mindfulness, I simply mean being watching yourself uh, almost as an observer and just kind of watching your thoughts, your feelings, and really starting to be aware. Those things are automatic. They do happen. And, and your response actually is very typical addict, and I'm a recovering addict, but where we kind of deny, even though uh, people just saw what we did, that that's on, almost also an automatic response. But I think the, the key to changing that is to almost go, when that happens, to go back like almost in slow motion, frame by frame, and say, what just happened? You know, what, what was the thought? What was I feeling? What, and really break it down in like, like a slow motion way so you can really identify the, the urge and that uh, belief or feeling that triggers that action before it actually occurs. And, and with practice, you can really break down and there's that, there will be that kind of decision point. Uh, and right now it's, it's unconscious. You're, you're zooming right past it. But if you can slow it down enough, there will be a point in which you say, no, I'm not going to do that. It, it hurts my wife. It's not good for my recovery. I'm going to, you know, do my three second plan or whatever it is that you do. But, but these things are automatic. Unfortunately, like all habits, the more you do it, the more it's reinforced. And so uh, it's, you're going to um, make mistakes at first, but I really encourage you to hang in there and really take a look at what is going on, especially the, the thoughts that are occurring um, and the feeling. And this is all automatic sometimes but it's it's and and in in many regards like a dream we, we can't be responsible for the elements that pop up into into a dream uh and sometimes we can't be responsible for uh, an attractive person walking in front of us but we certainly can be responsible for how we react to that and what we do with that and so um it's really important i think to to practice observe yourself and just don't don't give up hope because it does feel and it's true that you're zooming right through those reactions automatically. But if you can slow it down and really become kind of self-aware and with practice, you can really split that. And so uh, you don't have to go into that place uh, without uh, a choice, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I agree. And you, you know, I, I think it is really important because uh, there's, there's something in your frame of mind before you exit the house or whatever that, that feels like, you know, like you, you're probably already on the scan. And so even if it's, um, you know, and it will take us, but if it's this person is somebody's daughter, somebody's wife, somebody's what, what, you know, what, whatever, this person is a human and it's not just body parts. Um, and, but, you know, Dr. Rob has talked about that too. Porn in particular is body parts and, and so it dehumanizes. So you just, you know, you are clearly aware that it hurts your wife. And, you know, I think that probably I was thinking about that too. It's like deny it. And then, you know, come back and say, you are right. I, you know, I, I did that. I think it's just starting to own it, you know, even in that, you know, then hopefully the more, um, you get practice with, hopefully you have less practice eventually, but, um, but you know, more, the more you are able to, you know, to just, you know, be mindful. I, I was thinking that too, if you, it's being mindful, just being mindful of, you know, what is my intent when I walk out the door? My intent is to, you know, if I'm walking out with my partner, like I want to you know, engage in the relationship with this person and not be scanning off to here. So, so, you know, maybe it's intentional conversation, you know, while we're out and about and, you know, focus on that. I, I don't know, but, you know, it, it will take some trials and, you know, see what, see what works. And clearly it, this isn't working right now. So, you know, but, um, but I appreciate you asking too. Yeah. Next question. Um, are, uh, are there some questions that I, as a porn addict, can ask myself when I want to act out, which will help jar me into thinking and avoiding the behavior? That's a great question. That's a wonderful question. Thank you. Um, and I'd say yes, there are a couple uh, key questions that when you feel that impulse uh, to kind of do a little self-examination, a little mini, mini self-assessment, um, first of all, I'd say, what am I feeling right now? Um, what, and what's going on? And I would say, not just what am I feeling, but really try to locate it in your body. I think when we are caught up in these addictive behaviors, especially uh, these intensity addictions like drug uh, or sex or porn, um, 
we oftentimes it's such a head thing we kind of disconnect from what's really going on our, our that primal part of our brain takes over and so i think sometimes a great way to, to snap that spell is to like really what's what am i feeling in my body if, if anything some of us may be in emotional shock and numb and numb but if you're feeling that can be a great indicator so what am i feeling what am i thinking um in terms of our thoughts and it's really our thoughts that that are often spring out of our feelings but the thoughts guide our, our behavior um, and so, and the, the thought may be, you know, I, this is an urge that I, I can't resist, or I have to do this, or I can't deal with whatever this is going on over here, so I need to check out over here. Uh, and just kind of just be aware of this, these, the internal directives that you're getting based on your emotions and your feelings. And then the, the, the other thing, and this is something we do with our clients at Seeking Integrity, is to really ask them what unmet needs are going on. You know, is it a need for attention? Is it a need for uh, reassurance is that a need for um, affection uh, whatever it is I think it's really important to kind of understand what these needs are because as addicts over time we start to meet these unmet needs with with unhealthy behaviors and after a while we lose touch with what those needs even are and so I think um, it's important to kind of again have some of that mindfulness self-awareness piece but but to really ask what am I feeling and where in my body what am I thinking and, and what unmet needs, what, what needs is this behavior trying to address in, in a misguided way? And, and oftentimes those questions can really kind of do that jarring you're talking about, at least to break the, the spell. And the other thing I'd mentioned just on triggers and cravings, um, I always kind of talk about them as a wave. And so when you feel the trigger kind of comes and comes and comes, uh, if you've been out, ever been out in the ocean, the water is going to, you know, crest up, up to here and you, my God, I'm going to go under and, but the waves pass and triggers and cravings are just like that as well. If we don't grab onto them, if we just let them, let them wash over us and go on by, um, that really does make it easier. It's when we start to focus on it or grab it or hold on to it. That's when it really starts to gain strength. So just remember to kind of let it wash over you and, and keep going so you don't get trapped with it. That's a great analogy. I, you know, I, I really like that because, yes, they, it does feel, and, and I'm on a couple recovery group, uh, Facebook groups and stuff like that, and, and people will be posting, um, I, I, I can't stand the feeling right now. I want to act out so badly, you know, whatever, or use or whatever they're going to, you know, whatever fellowship I'm in, but, um, but like, like I, I get it in that moment. It's like, I just can't even stand it, you know, but it's, everything is temporary. Like you said, it's, you know, it'll wash over and you know, the wave may come back, but you know, it, it is temporary. And if I don't, you know, and for me too, it, um, kind of the jarring is, okay, I want to, I want to act out. Why do I want to do that? Yes. Even if it's like, I can't stand the, intensity of the feeling I'm feeling and I just want to numb out. Um, but this too shall pass. And how am I going to feel, you know, like the, the, the thinking it through, if I do this, how am I going to feel about myself afterwards too? You know, the, um, uh, like if I'm going to feel ashamed and I'm going to feel remorseful and all of that kind of stuff, is that worth it? And for me, you know, I, I've been able to say no so far. So, so the next question Oh, this is a good one, David. What helped you most in your personal recovery from sex addiction, sex addiction, if you don't mind sharing? After working all these years with sex addicts, what is the one message you would like all sex addicts to get that took you a long time to understand? Wow. These, are some, tough one. these are some gold standard questions tonight. Yes. I, I encourage everybody to come to our Wednesday <laughs> webinar. Yeah. So yeah. Is, thank you for that, that question. Uh, I am... I'm in recovery from alcohol and drugs. I'm not a sex addict uh, in recovery, but I've sure worked with sex addicts over the years. And I think really the message, the, 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 the heart of the question you're asking is the same. You know, what is the one message um, for sex addicts, but I think it pertains to all addicts. And for me in my recovery and for the people I've worked with over the years, um, the theme, the, the negative theme has really been this, all this shame and internalized shame and really low, feelings about oneself. And so I would sort of uh, boil it down into um, an affirmation or an, an affirmative statement. Um, and I wrote it down. Uh, I'm a beautiful person worthy of love. It's, it's something I think is really helpful for people because we have this belief that we are not worthy of love, that we are, there's a, um, 
I work mostly with gay men, um, but this, this phrase thing is universal, but the, nearly every client I've had over 20 years has in some way or another used these, almost these exact words, I feel like damaged goods. And I think that that resonates so much with addicts and, and the, the behaviors that we are trying to use to numb those feelings, that big hole that we talk about in 12-step program a lot, that big hole that we're trying to fill with, with behaviors that we just can never fill. And so I think to really reverse that and, and to really um, understand that we are people who are, we shouldn't have shame. You know, we should be proud. We should be self-loving. We should be compassionate and be worthy of that and worthy of giving it. And I think um, that one message of to really fight through the shame and that just terrible feelings about ourselves and really flip that and, and really try to embrace love and compassion, both for yourself and everybody around you, um, that really has made a huge difference for me. And I tell you one way I do that, because that, that's those are kind of, as I'm, I was speaking, then they sound kind of like 20,000 foot words. Um, one on the way, on the ground, practical way I do that is to do a quick gratitude list. It, it, that can really convert my, if I'm feeling bad, if I'm feeling canadic, if I'm feeling worthless, if I'm feeling shame, um, I can, if I, a gratitude list, and I'm talking five things, and that doesn't have to be a, a huge masterpiece, but five things is almost like an antitoxin or a, an antidote to those feelings that just reverses them so quickly. So, so that's the tool I use to help me get back in that mindset. But I think it's the mindset of really feeling worthy and lovable is, is the bottom line for me. And I also am not a sex addict, um, but was a typical female alcoholic and drug addict. And I also uh, struggle with an eating disorder. So, so I've had both the process addictions and the chemical addictions to address. And um, I very much like that, the, you know, the low self-worth. Um, one of the things I always, or almost always say when people uh, come in is, I wish I had a magic wand so I could let you feel how good recovery feels that it doesn't it doesn't change everything I don't have like my life isn't perfect or whatever but the attachment being truly connected to people that I care about and that care about me you know I was at a conference this weekend and um, people said I remember you I saw you last year you were so nice to me and I was like wow wow you know it was it was just amazing to have people like want to see me you know that wasn't really the case when I was out there so so just yeah, I too very much used um, a gratitude I still do uh, I cannot be in a bad place if I'm in gratitude they they can't coexist at least I've not figured out how to do that so um, yeah. uh, so so um, I, I, I think uh, and, and one other thing I know you said just one but everything is temporary so like we were just talking about the waves and crashing over you know so many people get caught up in like this is the worst thing ever well it is the worst thing ever right now but you know what a lot of times three days from now you won't even remember this one because it'll be on to the next thing so so like the there are tools in recovery to address every problem that I've had and there are people in recovery to support me and teach me you know how to live a different way of life and I would add to that the the really the the mechanics of how that works to me is is social connection the more we have a social network and people that can support us and be there for us. And, and, and that may be even just walking into a room of familiar faces, you know, uh, that's really a valuable resource when you're in that state. It's just, it's a protective resource. So I mentioned I was at a conference. So the conference was an addiction conference and gratefully they had a 12 step meeting at 7 a.m. before the conference started. And one of the best meetings I've been to in the last bunch of years was at, at that uh, on Saturday morning, and I'll, ju I'll just share this real quickly. So I was going to work out. The parking lot was flooded, so I was going to go to the gym. Well, the gym didn't open on the weekends till 7.30, so it didn't work for my schedule, and I was going, what am I going to do? And I thought, oh, I'll go to this meeting. And I was like, well, thank you, higher power, for putting me where I was supposed to be, actually, because being on the elliptical machine would not have been as good for me as being in that meeting. So so truly, the the you know, the, the, the recovery community has, you know, has so impacted my life, you know, uh, even if I go to a meeting where I think it's like not a great meeting, I always get something out of it and, and stay in recovery one more day. So, so the next question, can you explain the difference between objectifying women and noticing them? Oh, another great question. Um, 
So I guess in very simple terms, the, the difference between uh, noticing someone and objectifying them is, is something that happens in our heads. And it's um, when we see someone who is sexually attractive, and this happens, men are objectified as well, um, certainly by, by other gay men, if that's their issue. Oh, women too. And women too. Um, so th the difference simply is um, I'm taking someone in front of me and I can notice um, they may be attractive, but if I start thinking about oh, what I'd like to do with them sexually or thinking what they must be like in, a, in sexual terms or looking at a specific body part uh, that I might have fetishized or um, really sort of taking them, taking their, stripping away their humanity um, in terms of who they are. And it's, it's the kind of the antidote we use for this is to really help picture them as someone's daughter, someone's wife, someone's, um, someone's mother, um, and, and to really kind of break the spell of, of thinking of them in just strictly sexual terms. And so it's really seeing them in their totality and not dropping into this very narrow um, objectification where we see them as sexual objects, which of course is the root of that word. So really, really not seeing them as objects, but really helping them, uh, helping yourself seeing them as human beings, as, as that have feelings and, and uh, fears and, and joy and everything else, just like everyone else and are not uh, simply sexual beings. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's true. And women, you know, objectify men, uh, you know, I think they just get away with it a little easier, you know, I, I don't know, but, but um, yeah, and I agree. It, but, you know, like, I think it's okay to appreciate beauty and whether it's art or a, a lovely person or whatever, but, but yes, when it's like that person has nice and it's just, you know, body parts and, you know, it's no longer, um, you know, their humanity, that's problematic. Um, how can I tell if my husband has truly given up pornography if he still gets angry and defensive? I thought these things would go away. It's been a year already and he still sulks and shows no empathy. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so sometimes, first of all, I think it's going to be really hard to know if your husband's given up pornography. Uh, hopefully he's honest with you and, and is working an honest program. Um, and is doing that uh, and will disclose if there's a problem uh, when his, with his ongoing recovery. Um, I don't necessarily think we can equate being angry and was he ever defensive with him acting out. Now that certainly is not characteristic of a strong recovery, but I've seen people who were not engaged in their acting out behavior, but who were still stuck in some old feelings and ways of thinking. And in fact, I've seen people, um, when we took away their uh, coping mechanisms, which were the acting out behavior or the other drugs or alcohol, um, they may have not been using those things, but nothing else changed. And they were still, they were even more angry than they were before because they were frustrated. And all those feelings that used to be kind of self-medicated or numbed were there in full force. And so I think it's really important to, um, uh, for that, for that person, for your husband, to really do some more work, right? Remember, with therapy and in groups, I think anger, anger and defensive is not a not a place you want to be if you're working a program of recovery. And to me, that would be indicative of of other underlying issues. And we know that a lot of addictions have this trauma in the past. There may be some elements of trauma that are not addressed. There may be some other triggering thoughts and behaviors. Uh, sometimes people do change their behaviors. So the disruptive thoughts um, are still going on in there and in their minds. And that kind of leads this to this kind of muddled state where people claim to be in recovery, but you can't really see much progress. I have been in meetings, you know, where people identify themselves as 20 years sober and they are, they're, they're sober from drugs and alcohol in the meetings I go to, but they're angrier than anybody I've ever met. You know, they're clearly not working a great program of recovery. Um, so it's possible to, to be absent and angry, but it's sure not fun. And I would really recommend that, that he do some maybe deeper work and see what's going on, because it sounds like he's kind of stuck, uh, stuck in place. And so the answer to your question, I don't think you can really directly say if he's acting out or not. Um, it's not a good sign. And if somebody's angry and defensive, if they're not acting out now, they're certainly increasing the risk of relapsing on that behavior if they don't get that under control. But I think it's, it's um, 
as we say to our clients, that uh, giving up those behaviors is just the very beginning. Uh, you know, and that's, that's step one. That's just the beginning of the therapeutic work as well. That opens the door to all the other healing. And that anger and defensiveness falls into the category of the other healing that could happen after those behaviors are long gone. So um, I'd encourage you to get support, get therapy, really work on whatever else is going on under there under the surface. Yeah, I, yeah. So a couple of things. I, ditto everything um, David just said. In AA, we dry drunk, so that uh, I'm I'm not drinking, but boy, I you know I'm just as nasty, sometimes nastier than when I was drinking because, you know, I no longer have that escape. So um, so that was one of the things I thought of. The other I wondered about is if, if he's sulking and shows no empathy. So if he's really trying, like he's actually working a program, has a sponsor, doing the steps, whatever, if he's a 12-stepper, but uh, otherwise doing something, you know, uh, uh, then, um, you, I, you know, I even wondered if he has been um, a seen for a, an eval for like clinical depression. You know, maybe he's got some underlying depression and needs you know, need something to, um, you know, to ad address that. I don't know. Um, um, I'm with David that, you know, it's, it's tougher to tell. But, and the other thing I was thinking too is uh, Dr. Rob wrote a book called Out of the Dog House. And if you're trying to rebuild trust, then it, you know, it also rebuilds empathy. It's, it's right. one of the skills that, you know, if, if I'm really working on this relationship, then, you know, these are the things I need to do. And being, you know, angry and defensive at my wife is not really going to help the relationship. So, um, so agree that I think, um, I think stuck and there are things to do to get unstuck. Um, it's just what is his level of um, uh, commitment. And one more thing, I know lots of people that warm a seat in a 12-step meeting and they go, well, I'm going to my meetings. But you know, the, the meetings are where you get support and connection and tips on how to work the steps, but it really is doing the work. You know, it's the freedom. Um, my, my fourth and fifth step were transformative for me. That was the, that was the key to getting rid of a lot of no, getting rid of most of my shame, I ended up doing a second one, but, you know, it was what really helped me, um, you know, be able to move forward. So I would have been stuck and angry and scared and shameful. I would have relapsed. I know that. But so uh, encourage him to do things that will make it different because he doesn't have to be um, you know, miserable. I mean, then, you know, then what's the point? So, right. Um, are there some questions that I can ask myself when I want to act out, which will help me to think and jar myself into better behavior? Yeah, I think that's really similar to what, what we talked about before, where we, it's kind of this issue of self-awareness. Um, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? Feeling in the body? What, what resources do I have? What do I need right now for myself? And what can I do for myself? And I think just to not to fall into being a victim or feeling helpless, but to really um, have the resources to take action on your own behalf. And that, you know, I, I uh, always still, I'm in recovery many years and still have a list of people in my wallet, uh, now in my phone, um, that I can call 24 hours a day. I have, you know, because in a, and it really happens, thank God, but when I get really flummoxed about something, um, I get kind of scatterbrained. I'm not really thinking too clearly. And, and I think that's even more uh, potentially harmful if you're a newcomer or new in recovery, because then there's a higher rate of relapse and risk of relapse. So, so when I'm in that state of like, uh, not you know, kind of thrown by a by a, a curveball in life, um, I, I really, it's good to have my lists, my resources all lined up. It's like the same thing with uh, when we talk about relapse prevention planning. We talk about emergency exit plans like kids do in elementary school, where they practice the drills over and over and over again to really identify your high risk situations develop a strategy in advance, and then practice it, practice it, practice it. So when it does occur, if it should, uh, and I hope it doesn't, but if it does, it's going to be an automatic response on your part. So a lot of these things are almost like practicing our recovery behaviors even before we need to uh, in, the, in the event of an urge to act out or use drugs or alcohol. So just it's a matter of clear thinking in advance, identifying those high-risk situations, and making a plan well in advance, and then always being ready. Because re really, you never know. Uh, and I think, Tammy, this is probably your, and we both had a lot of years in recovery, and I never know where those things are going to come from. You know, just somebody looks at me cross-eyed one day, and if I'm in a bad mood or something, you know, it, I'm off. So um, 
it's, it's important to know yourself and have those tools ready. But we also have enough time and skills to go, I'm off. What's, what's going on with me that is, you know, so, so one, a, a couple of things. I use post-it notes. I still use post-it notes because that was the technology. But I'm thinking if you're accessing porn on your phone, if I made my screensaver, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? You know, I would, I would have my screensaver. So the first thing I look at is before sure. I even access it, if it's on my computer, screensaver what am i thinking what am i feeling you know what do i choose to do i mean whatever but but have it be before you go to wherever you're going to go you know that i mean uh, you know i i keep my um my uh chip on my keychain so if i was going to drive to her you know guess what would be dangling on my keychain my coin and I would go, gosh, do I really want to do that? I don't know. I mean, that, that's just not, so there are ways to interrupt the system. And I would, I would encourage you to think of practical tools that are like, what are you going to see? You know, journal, like, you know, cause uh, my thought was if somebody is, up, is completely into porn, they're looking at dissociating and not being attached. So so have a journal next to the computer or whatever on top of the computer, whatever, and go, I'm going to journal what I'm feeling and thinking before I get online, whatever will help you interrupt the system, which is what you're looking for. But so what are, what are things that are going to be physical barriers or, or something that's vis visible before you engage in that behavior? You know, maybe, maybe that would it's help. Kind of the equivalent I used to hear about, people with spending problems, putting their credit cards in the ice trays, you know, in the refrigerator, in the freezer, yeah, yeah. it slows them down. Of course, can they yeah. melt it and get them? Yeah, sure. But it slows the process down. Yeah. And by that time, the craving is often gone and the, yeah. the damage hasn't been done. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's like, what can I do to physically interrupt the system? And, you know, so, so okay. just some ideas. Okay. The next question, what's the role of experiencing sexual trauma in childhood in the development of sex addiction? What is the percentage of sex addicts for the history of early um, sexual abuse? There's no stats on any of this stuff. It hasn't been studied enough, but what are your well, thoughts? There's, there's some interesting research. Um, there, uh, there's something called adverse childhood events, which are uh, anything bad that happens to a kid, right? It can be abuse, whether it's emotional, sexual, physical. It can be the death of a sibling, a, pr a bad parental divorce, uh, mental health in the family, whatever it is that kind of disrupts a normal childhood. Um, we know there's almost a one-to-one -one correlation. If there's an event like that, and if there's more events like that, your chances of adult addiction, and by the way, adult mental health and shorter lifespan all go up. And so uh, I think it's really important to really understand the, the direct link between how these childhood experiences affect adult behavior. So there, there is a lot of research that points to that. Um, in terms of the, the specific mechanics of that, uh, I think a couple things happen. One, um, if someone is abused or has trauma uh, in childhood, that really impacts what I call their core beliefs. That the, the, we were talking about those earlier, those, those things about myself. I'm, I feel like damaged goods or I'm unsafe or I can't protect myself or um, uh, I'm unlovable or I'm, I'm, I'm unworthy or I have to use sex to get validation or I have to, I have to perform sexually for love or for acceptance. You know, all these things get, get formed really early and children just aren't wired. You know, they're not mature enough to be able to kind of dispel those. So those kind of things go right in and they're absorbed. They're almost, and I took, I describe it almost like software, you know, it's operating in the background, even as adults, but we're not even aware of those beliefs anymore. And so those things go in there. Child, the child has no ability to kind of, um, resist them. And, and one of the things of the work in recovery is to really look at those beliefs, which have been really fueling some of the addictive behavior and change. Them. You really unroot them, see that they're not true and make new ones, new positive ones. Uh, the other thing though, that I want to say beyond those kind of mechanical steps in the leading to addiction is it does something else that's quite devastating. And that is it teaches children early on how to dissociate. I think when kids um, experience that trauma, most often they have no, the only option they have is to float away. Uh, they can't physically leave, they may not, and it's a classic of being sexually abused or even physically abused, you know, people just dis disconnect from their body. And sometimes 
it's very vivid and they can, you know, they, we talk about people at the top and floating in the ceiling looking at their body, but other times they're just numb and they're, they're gone. And that, and I experienced this myself, the, the ability to really know how to float away or disconnect or dissociate. Um, I, I was an expert at that as a kid. And so by the time I encountered alcohol or drugs, which just facilitated that, I was in heaven. And so I think really uh, uh, addictive behaviors and addictive substances really just are a, a way to keep that process going. But we learn how to do that and the uh, this protective uh, uh, aspects of floating away, you know, dissociating. I mean, it saved our lives probably when we were kids. It doesn't serve us as adults. And so, um, but but those are some really dangerous, I think, things that that childhood trauma can do. I could talk about this for all, for two days, um, but there's a lot of, um, I would say, in my experience, almost every sex addict and porn addict has a traumatic history. And I think we could even generalize almost every addict has some kind of trauma in their history. Now, the one interesting thing, and Dr. Rob may have talked about this, there's these younger porn addicts who, um, have grown up with digital technology. They're on their phones. They're on the computer all the time. They have a different kind of sex addiction and porn addiction. They not necessarily have the trauma, but they've had a whole different experience with technology. But I would say for, for what we call classic sex addicts, um, there's almost always trauma in the past and it, it's quite devastating. So it's, it's one of the reasons we recommend and incorporate uh, what we call trauma-informed therapy at what the programs we do but it's really critical that the timing is carefully understood because if someone is just coming in after an active addiction, if they're in early recovery, they're really in no shape to deal with deep trauma work. And so a lot of the things we do early on, and you can, if you're going to meetings, I recommend this if you're early on, is just not to go, we talk about not making changes, not making any kind of major decisions, but really just consolidating the tools, getting through those initial periods of triggers and cravings and some of the basic addiction stuff before you delve into that underlying stuff. We had a client recently who uh, had a lot of relapses every time he started to do trauma work. And, you know, that's, and we see that around, uh, uh, Tammy, you may have seen this too, when people do fourth steps or fifth steps, it can be so upsetting. There's a lot of relapse there. And I think because those trauma reactions are triggered. And so we really have to take important steps anytime we dig into this uh, painful stuff of our past that, you know, in my case, and I think I speak for every addict, we, I was running from my whole life, you know, until I got sober. And so, um, and that's something to really uh, handle carefully. And so I think um, it's something that has to be done, but the, the timing is really important when we deal with trauma and recovery. Uh, and I agree. And a couple of other things I was thinking is, I get a lot of people that go, oh, I didn't have any trauma. And and so many things, even for me, I was like, you know, I grew up in a nice and whatever, you know, and what I learned was that there, you know, trauma or neglect, there are, there are things, there are things that happen to us that most of us, no, some of us can't even identify what it was. So like, we just go, I have a normal childhood. My every, everything was great. Everything was great. But then when we start unpeeling everything, you go, oh, 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 those, those things which, you know, well, that's just how things were. Um, so it, it isn't always like some, if you're sexually abused as a child, you absolutely, you know, know you were traumatized, et cetera. But, you know, just even um, Enid Gray wrote a great book, Neglect uh, the Silent Abuser. And right. yeah, and it really was like, like that is, an, that is like, you have to be small. You, you can't have needs because th there isn't enough bandwidth, you know, if parents are, you know, unavailable for whatever reason. So, so um it, talk about that we got a whole bunch more questions so we'll, we'll keep moving and oh the other thing I was gonna say is just because you know it can be triggering doesn't mean you shouldn't do a fourth and fifth step so. just something <laughs> really quick on that too about yeah. trauma because yeah. I think we think of trauma as you know a war injury or a catastrophic yeah. event in the Bahamas and the hurricane or yeah. a car accident trauma though it's really important to find a therapist that understands trauma as much more universal we're understanding that low-grade trauma like being bullied being chronically bullied can result in the same kind of traumatic reactions of PTSD as a major traumatic event. So it's really important to understand that 
just what Tammy said, it's a whole variety of those things. Yeah, big T trauma and little T traumas. They exactly. brush it, they, they call it. So, so I'm gonna switch over to the chat. There's a, a, a question in there. I find a year and a half after disclosure of my husband's sex addiction, I feel sort of bored and depressed. His recovery is going well, but I was running on so much adrenaline for weeks before and months after the, the disclosure. Now I feel I've come down um, from some kind of high, even though it was traumatic, terrible high. Is this something you often see? That's a really great observation. And I think uh, what you're experiencing is not so uncommon. Um, sex addiction particularly and chemsex are all what I call intensity addictions for everybody. Uh, it's all about stimulation and super stimulation, certainly for the addict, but the, the drama that creates, the, the emotional ups and downs, the, the anger, the fear, the, just the range of emotions going up and down uh, takes up a lot of space and is, becomes a way of life. In, in a kind of horrible way, and it becomes so preoccupying that it's a problem. And so when that, when that is given up, um, and this is such a great awareness for me, because it's a reminder, uh, we always talk to the addicts about, you know, you have to really compensate for this lack of stimulation in your life. And for a while, nothing's gonna seem interesting, because uh, it requires this very high levels of stimulation to, to get aroused. Uh, and so things that used to be pleasurable, and I'm not talking about sexual things, I'm talking about hobbies, food, you know, playing with your dog, everything's kind of gray and can be dull until your brain resets. And, and the partners experience really the same thing because they're caught up in this whirlwind of drama uh, in the addiction. And it's really important, I think, for them to be able to um, start to build a life of healthy um, satisfaction, right, for themselves, being able to receive pleasure. And I think part of it there's a, there's a traumatic response that goes with living with an addict of like, you know, you're, you're on guard, right, all the time and things come out of left field and uh, you start to build trust and then it, it can be washed away again. It's just, it's just up and down. So I think um, now that it sounds and I'm happy, there's some calm in your life, um, but things may seem a little dull. And I would encourage you to really explore those feelings and understand part of this is a process of both of your brains resetting to where um, you can enjoy what we call natural rewards, uh, which, which are good food and company and belonging and being loved and sex and uh, all the stuff that doesn't have an addictive component to it. But that takes time. But I, it, it may also take a little bit of effort on your part to break through that. And I would really um, find things that uh, give your life purpose, give your life passion. Uh, I found that um, meaning, that having a sense of meaning and connection was the way I kind of broke through some of that gray fog of what we call anhedonia, this inability to experience pleasure um, and start to enjoy life again. But part of that will happen automatically. But if it doesn't, I would really encourage you to seek out things that give you pleasure and work on correcting that. Yeah, yeah, things that um, nurture you, so. Okay, next question. Seven months from discovery of sex addiction throughout and before our 10 year relationship, porn escorts and arrangement sites. And I'm in recovery attending 12 steps and haven't acted out since. I've uh, often read and heard that you recommend taking a sexual break. My wife has made it clear she wants me to show her that I desire her. So we have been having regular sex. However, in my mind, it clearly isn't completely healthy. She never wants me to touch her after as she imagines that I must have held other sexual partners afterwards. Is there likely to be problems in continuing this? I do feel there is some connection there that we don't have at other times at this stage. She is nowhere near letting me hold her hand or any other forms of intimacy that I'm looking for in our day-to-day -day lives. I do plan to bring this up with our upcoming couple session. Well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And that's, that's a, a, a painful situation, right? I think a lot of couples have, uh, it's a very tender, uh, decision about re-engaging sexually like that in, in terms of vulnerability and and um, so there are different time limits for different people different recommendations but but you have engaged now in, in, in sexual behavior with her however there's still to me at least seems there's a lot of intimacy issues there uh, a lot of uh, barriers um, I would recommend um, getting the assistance of a sex therapist who understands some of the ways to kind of a connection. You have a couples therapist and that person may be able to help you as well. But there are specific um, sex therapy exercises like Masters and Johnson's Sensate Focus, which is a, a non-genital, non-sexual 
uh, exercise where couples learn how to communicate with each other uh, in sensual terms. So there's rubbing, stroking, massaging, and, and the partner who's receiving it gives feedback, yes, I like that, no, I don't. And, but it's, the point is not to have sex, but the point is to reacquaint you with your partner and to build trust and to build nonverbal communication. So there's, there's techniques like that that might help you break through some of that. Um, but I think it's definitely something to work on in your couple's therapy. And I hope your wife is also getting some support for that because um, you know, there's a lot of trust issues there, of course, and vulnerability and hurt that may be affecting these things. But I think it's, to me as a therapist, it's really unhealthy to um, uh, have a partner comparing you know, current sexual behavior with her intimate partner with, with what the imagination of what it might have been like acting out with, with someone. So and that's, that's not a headspace that you want to be in when you're trying to uh, have a healthy intimacy with your partner. So I, I talk about this with your couples therapy therapist. Um, it's not unusual for a sex therapist to work tandem. It's a couple sessions, sometimes very brief, but they might be able to offer additional uh, nuggets of recommendation that could be helpful. And, you know, and I agree. And I'm going like, I mean, Dr. Rob has talked about it. It can be a year and a half before somebody's, you know, not angry and um, you're rebuilding trust. So the fact that she's having sex with you is, is probably, you know, a good sign. A couple of things I thought of too is like, you know, do you go out on dates? Is there, you know, like, are you like, like just, you know, almost the platonic, not platonic, just the like the introductory dates, like, and so there's an opportunity just to hold hands. Um, and then I was also, I, you know, I reread your um, comments and I don't hear that you've had a formal disclosure. There's been discovery, but I, you know, I don't read that you've had formal disclosure. And one of the things with formal disclosure, not that she, I mean, she should never have to hear, you know, the actual gory details, but, um, but a lot of times that helps um, uh, the foundation so that it, so that the, so trust can be um, uh, you know better built so you know I'm, and and one more thing and I don't want to sound snarky but uh, you know you've been it's been seven months and you talk about a 10-year um, relationship so you know like the, the the table is I've done this much you know uh, I've been I've been good this I hate to use good I've been um, abstinent this long and I was acting out this long. So, so it takes time, you know, like all of this stuff takes time. You know, the fact that you're still together, that she's, you know, having sex with you, that she wants some sort of relationship with you is a fantastic sign because um, there's a lot of couples that seven months out are, you know, are struggling in a different um, and, and more foundational way. So um, I, uh, Bill and Ginger Burkaw also wrote a uh, sexual reintegration um, books. I, I like what you were talking about, the sensei um, things, but they also did a sexual reintegration. You, you may be part, past part of some of that, but, but they also have some um, uh, touching and, uh, you know, less non-genital sexual, uh, you know, touching and things to reintegrate. So that might be an option too. So um, let's see. Uh, uh, this one's a long one. We only have a few more minutes, so let's see. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this. Would it be fair to say that most addictions derive from a deep-seated psychologic issue, such as to say an early childhood adult trauma? Furthermore, that these issues and the resulting maladaptive behaviors need to be addressed in conjunction with the addiction recovery process. I think that really sums it up very well. Uh, yes, that's, I think absolutely. I think we see that most addictions derive from these early traumatic experiences and some kind of maladaptive behavior the child makes often just to save themselves, to save their sometimes physical lives, emotional lives, or to just protect their psyche. And they um, dissociate, they false beliefs about themselves. There's all kinds of things kids do. But those, when they grow up, they become addicts often. And then the process of recovery really is unearthing those and correcting them uh, to really create new affirmative beliefs about yourself and new behaviors. And um, those absolutely need to be addressed uh, because they will, you know, addiction is not just about the substance or the acting out. It, it's all about these behaviors. And, and I, I really believe that addictions function. They, they serve a purpose in our lives. You know, I didn't drink and use drugs for, it was no longer fun for the last 
years I was doing it, I did it because I had to. And I had to, not only because of physical dependence, but I had to because it, was, it served a psychological function to keep me separated from stuff I didn't want to touch or, or go or believe or feel. And so I think um, if I just rip away the alcohol, that stuff is all going to come flooding back. I really need tools to deal with it. So it's a big, long, I don't mean to over, be overwhelming, but it's a, it's a big process of, of, exa of self-examination, not just of giving up the behaviors or the drink or the drug. Yeah, we, we talked about the person that was, um, uh, was unhappy, you know, like the, the dry drunk, you know, I mentioned, and um, it's really hard early in recovery because if you're trying to not do the behaviors and you don't have the tools yet. And so you really are relying on, you know, and for me, you know, um, you know, I, w I went to therapy and I went to 12 steps. And so people were supporting me enough that I could, well, just for today or just for this hour, I could not do whatever it was, you know. And um, so I had to take it in little increments until I had enough tools in my toolbox that I could, you know, I could do that for myself and then even share that with other people so that I could be a support for them. So, you know, it, it's all a process, but, you know, just like you said, David, you know, the, the addiction isn't about, you know, sex addiction isn't about sex. You know, drinking isn't because the alcohol tastes so good. You know, gambling isn't because, you know, I, I, you know, I have so much fun sitting in front of a slot machine or whatever. I mean, it, it's, it's not any of those things. It's about, I need to escape. I need to not feel I need to numb out. It, it's it's all of those things, um, uh, and and so learning to be able to tolerate what not tolerable, you know, and go okay. I'm going to survive. Like you're talking about the waves, you know. It's like okay, I can survive this moment where I'm so uncomfortable in my own skin because this right. too shall pass, you know. And I can pick up the phone. Even if it feels like it weighs 500 pounds, I can pick up the phone and call somebody. I can, you know, I can do something different that, you know, that gives me, you know, gives me options. Um, but I've said to so many people, you know, when I've heard their histories, you know, thank goodness you have an addiction because, you know, honestly, I think, you know, I, I, I think some of them would have suicided just because like they, they had such an intolerable, you know, past. So this gave them something to escape to, you know, the dissociation when you're young and you can't, you're trapped well, and then, not, you know, then acting out great, you know, this is, you know, but then it quits working and now it's causing more problems and, you know, and, and with some of it, it's killing me, you know, so, um, so finding recovery is the healthy choice and gives us tools to be able to, you know, to deal with all of that. So. We have one more quick one, there. And, um, and so, so for those of you that um, yes, there, one of them is really long, and we won't be able to get to that one. But somebody says, uh, "I'm trying to remember the three things to consider before acting out or expressing anger or irritation." Um, it, it's it's halt. I've, I added an S, so it's hungry, angry, lonely, tired, or stressed because I found I was vulnerable, um, particularly with my food one like if i'm stressed i'm like you know get me to the fringe you know so so it right. was so i added the yes but hungry angry lonely tired or stressed for me but you know i have to be aware of that and if you know if i haven't slept well you know i'm going to be more vulnerable if i'm lonely if you know then i need to go to a meeting or connect with somebody else you know so so i you know i understand those things will make me more vulnerable in the first place. So then my bandwidth to be able to handle whatever else is coming in on me exactly. is diminished. So exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we are out of time. If you like what you heard, join Dr. David on Wednesday nights. He does this um, on yeah, Wednesday nights important. at 5 p.m. I, I do a little introduction of a topic usually, but we do the same question and answer and anything you want to ask. So please, please join us if you can. I, I've been on with him on Wednesday nights um, before, and the first one I did with him was on resilience, and and I, I learned so much. One of the things he talked about was that it takes practice. I thought you were either born resilient or you weren't, and he was like, no, it's like a muscle. You have to learn to build it up, so great information always. Thank you so much to all of you who participated and asked questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but uh, Dr. Rob will be back next week, um, um, Monday night. And if you haven't participated in drop-in groups yet, I'd encourage you to do so. So thank you all. Great. Thanks. Hi, David. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.